Hello and welcome to The Broken Sword. Today we are looking at the full story of Frodo Baggins. Frodo Baggins of the Shire is debatably the most famous of all the Hobbits, alongside a certain Bilbo Baggins as well. Frodo took on the unimaginably horrendous task of a leading role in the quest to destroy the One Ring, and it left awful effects on him. By appearance he did not particularly stand out from the crowd that are the Hobbits, but the achievements he gained meant he was certainly not like the rest. So, as a character that I feel does not always get enough love, I felt today was a good day to go over the full story of Frodo Baggins with you all. Frodo Baggins was born on September 22nd, 2968 of the Third Age in Middle-earth. He was born to the hobbits of Drogo Baggins and Primula Brandybuck. Drogo was considered a perfectly acceptable average and respectable shire hobbit and was the son of a Baggins and a Bulger, and his wife Primula has little known about her except she was the daughter to a Brandybuck and a Toop, so there was a good background of hobbit in Frodo. Sadly though, Frodo would know almost nothing of his parents, for they would both die in a mysterious and suspicious boating accident in 2980 of the Third Age, meaning Frodo was only 12 at that time, a very young age for a hobbit as they are not thought to become of age until they were 33, and when you consider that hobbits tended to live on average somewhere around 90 to 100 years, they are considered young for a good portion of their lives. And also here, I thought it could be quite interesting to bring up a bit of a fan theory about his parents' death. This is one that is never confirmed, so perhaps improbable, but maybe not impossible, and that is that Gollum killed Frodo's parents. So picture it, it is 2941 of the Third Age, and this hobbit Bilbo Baggins comes into Gollum's cave and makes off with his precious golden ring. Now, Gollum would want revenge, but all he ever has to go off is Baggins and Shire. So with the Shire proving difficult to find for even Sauron's servants, thinking it takes 39 years for Gollum to find it is not unthinkable. Gollum now is in the Shire and discovers these two Bagginses out on their boat, and knowing the link and the evil that the One Ring brings out in him, he kills both of them, only to discover that they do not in fact have this ring. So he must run once again. Now, after going over that, I would say that I do not necessarily believe this myself, as surely Gollum would have just continued through the Shire until he found Bilbo, rather than just believing that because these two Baggerses did not have the ring that none of them did, maybe it would not quite work, but it could still pour some added spice onto Frodo and Smeagol's relationship if it was in fact the case. But now anyway, back to why we are here, Frodo Baggins. So with his parents gone, Frodo would go to live in Brandy Hall with the Brandybuck hobbits from his mother's side, being taken in by the Master of Buckland, Rorimac Goldfather Brandybuck, his genuine uncle, as his guardian. Frodo would embrace his mischievous side in his childhood, like when he was caught by Farmer Maggot when trying to steal some mushrooms, which led to his long-standing fear of being chased by Farmer Maggot's three dogs. Frodo would not spend too many years with Rorimac though, as he was later adopted by Bilbo Baggins of Bag End in 2989, when Frodo was in his early 20s, or tweens as the hobbits called it, being the irresponsible 20s between childhood and coming of age at 33. So now Frodo lived with Bilbo, of whom the two happened to share the same birthday, and he very much took to living in Hobbiton, and despite what is often said, Bilbo was not in fact his true uncle, in the same way Rorimac was. He was in fact technically a distant cousin, but either way they grew a strong father-son type bond. Frodo would be the only one that Bilbo would let read his memoirs, the book of There and Back Again that recounted all of his adventures, and the two would also go on many long walks along the water within the Shire, being one of the rivers that ran through it, where they would discuss all things about his adventures. In time Frodo would be named as Bilbo's heir as well, meaning everything, including Bag End, would be his, much to the annoyance of the Sackville spoon stealing Bagginses, and also much to Bilbo's joy. Now the years would roll on until a big day came upon just not Frodo, but Bilbo as well, and the Shire too. In 3001 of the Third Age, Frodo would turn 33, 
and so would come of age, and on that same day Bilbo would hit the grand age of 111. A great party was thrown, and it was here that Bilbo played his disappearing trick. However, Frodo was pre-warned about what would happen, so did not succumb to the same shock as the other party goers. What this did mean for Frodo though is that, with Bilbo now leaving, he was now the master of Bag End as well as getting Bilbo's other possessions that he did not take with him, which included a magical golden ring. A ring that would play an unthinkable role in the rest of Frodo's life. So that dramatic night would then come to an end, Gandalf would warn Frodo to never wear the ring and to keep it secret, keep it safe, and Frodo would hand out the gifts that Bilbo had left for his guests. Then from here the months would roll on. Frodo would continue with some of those traditions that he had grown with Bilbo, like taking those long walks, and in time would grow ever more eager to see the mountains, just like his uncle had. His friends even believed he was meeting with the elves too from time to time, very unusual behaviour for a hobbit. Frodo would continue in this way for 17 years, in which Gandalf visited him several times in those first 7 years, but then not again until the year 3018. This is when Gandalf would finally return with some most unwelcomed news. That golden ring, that magic ring, that was in fact the one ring forged by the Dark Lord Sauron long ago. Gandalf also brought news that the creature Gollum that Bilbo had claimed the ring off had given this information of Shire and Baggins to those in Mordor under torture. So Frodo was no longer safe here. They decided that Frodo must make plans to leave Bag End as soon as possible, without arousing suspicion, so in the end they came up with the plan of selling Bag End and moving out to Crick Hollow, albeit Frodo would want to wait until his 50th birthday several months later to make sure things were more believable. This way now, once moved, Frodo would be on the edge of the Shire and could sneak off on his mission with the least number of eyes watching. However, Frodo would not be alone in all of this. During those few months of planning, Samwise Gamgee, Frodo's gardener, would be tasked with helping Frodo after listening in on conversations with Gandalf. Also, Frodo's cousins, Meriadoc Brandybuck and Peregrine Took, along with his good friend Fredegar Fatty Bolger, would work out that there was trouble and decide that they would help, albeit not revealing this to Frodo just yet. September 22nd, Frodo and Bilbo's birthday would now come and go, and Gandalf had not returned to travel with Frodo like he had promised. So, the next day, without Gandalf, Frodo left anyway on foot with Sam and Pippin, while Merry and Fatty had gone ahead with a pony and cart taking Frodo's items. He used often to say there was only one road, that it was like a great river, its springs were at every doorstep, and every path was its tributary. It's a dangerous business, Frodo, going out of your door, he used to say. You step into the road, and if you don't keep your feet, there is no knowing where you might be swept off to. It was certainly a dangerous business, and it did not take long at all for Frodo to run into his first bit of danger. While the three hobbits were making their way to Crick Hollow, they began hearing someone approaching on a horse. Frodo felt very uneasy at this, and told the other two he wished to hide while they passed. The three hide as the rider appears. It is one of the Nazgul. Frodo begins to feel an unbelievable urge to put on the One Ring, of which he nearly gives in to, however the rider disappears before it is too late, and they are all shaken by this encounter. They made off again, but not long after, another one appeared. The sound of hooves stopped. As Frodo watched, he saw something dark pass across the lighter space between two trees, and then halt. It looked like the black shade of a horse led by a smaller black shadow. The black shadow stood close to the point where they had left the path, and it swayed from side to side. Frodo thought he heard the sound of snuffling. The shadow bent to the ground, and then began to crawl towards him. Once more the desire to slip on the ring came over Frodo, but this time it was stronger than before. So strong that, almost before he had realised what he was doing, his hand was groping in his pocket. But at that moment there came a sound like mingling song and laughter. Clear voices rose and fell in the starlit air. The black shadow straightened up and retreated. It climbed onto the shadowy horse and seemed to vanish across the lane into the darkness on the other side. Frodo breathed again. Elves, claimed Sam in a hoarse whisper. Elves, sir. These elves were led by Gildor, a Noldoran elf of the House of Finrod. 
they took in the hobbits and were massively impressed with Frodo's knowledge of their language, even revealing that they had seen Bilbo and Frodo on their walks, despite the hobbits having never seen them. Frodo, Pippin and Fatty were given warning to flee from the Black Riders any time they came near, and then after a little more conversation, the entire group fell asleep. When the hobbits awoke the next morning, the owls had already left, so the three made off again, far less keen than they had been when they first set out from Bag End. After one more sighting of a Black Rider, the three came to Farmer Maggot's farm. Frodo remembered the incident with the mushrooms and was cautious about entering, but they met the farmer and Farmer Maggot won them over with his kind welcome and good food. Farmer Maggot revealed to them that a Black Rider had in fact come about his part asking about a Baggins, but rather than push too hard for answers from them, he gave them a lift in his wagon to Buckleberry Ferry, keeping them out of sight. While on this part of the journey they bumped back into Merry who had gone out in search of them, then they managed to make their way to Crick Hollow without being stopped again. Now in Crick Hollow the other hobbits revealed to Frodo that they knew of the One Ring and his plan to travel to Rivendell. They had made up their mind without Frodo. Merry, Pippin and Sam would go with him, while Fatty would remain at Frodo's house to try and put off the scent of anyone who came asking for him. They would only stay in the house for the night, then make off the next morning, with this part of their journey taking them into the Old Forest. Here they would get taken on the path to the Withy Windle, a river that ran through the forest, and then came under the influence of Old Man Willow, a great willow tree that was evil at heart for anything that wandered in those woods. It appeared they may be crushed before the enigma that is Tom Bombadil came to their rescue, with him then taking the hobbits back to his house, also meeting Aubrey, his wife. Frodo was intrigued by Tom, wishing to know just who or what he was, but no answer came. Tom revealed he could see Frodo when he used the One Ring, and also that the ring had no power over him, a mightily mysterious and powerful being. In fact, we do have a video going over some possibilities to the answer of that, so check it out if you are interested. But anyway, once feeling stronger again the hobbits set off from Old Tom's house, this time making their way into the Barrow Downs. Another mistake. The Barrow Whites captured them, but luckily Frodo awoke just in time, struck the Barrow White, and then sang Tom's song so he could come and save them. And save them again, he did. Tom got the hobbits back on their path and left them as they carried on the road to Bree, where they came into the Prancing Pony from Tom's recommendation. Frodo would meet Barlamin Butterbur here, the innkeeper, and he would hear unnerving news from him. Gandalf was not here. Frodo was unsure what to do, but soon ended up talking to a mysterious ranger who went by the name of Strider. After a couple of drinks here, Pippin had begun to talk a bit too freely, so Frodo sang a song as a distraction. But this distraction failed, for Frodo would fall from the table he stood on with the ring then falling on his finger, causing him to disappear from all eyes around. The best thing to do after all of this commotion was just return to their rooms, where Strider found them. After hearing Strider's words and receiving a letter late from Gandalf that had been in the possession of Barlamin, Frodo felt in his heart that he could trust Strider, so he agreed to let him lead them to Rivendell. After avoiding an attempted attack by the Nazgul in the inn that night, the Hobbits and Strider set out in the morning. They passed through Chetwood and the Midgewater Marshes before they finally came to Weathertop. Here, five of the Nazgul attacked them and Frodo succumbed to the draw of the One Ring in their presence and got stabbed by the Witch King's Morgul blade in the shoulder for his effort. Strider managed to drive them off, but he knew Frodo did not have much time and needed to get to Rivendell as fast as possible, despite them being many days away yet. Twelve days passed and Frodo was becoming very close to turning into a wraith himself, but they were met here by the elf Glorfindel, one of the mightiest of his race still left in Middle Earth, and by the word of Alrond he had come to them and then set Frodo upon his horse, Asphalath, and got him to set off as fast as possible away from the chase in Nazgul. Once across the ford of Bruinin, Frodo was so close to the wraith world, but he still managed to use his last ounce of strength to stand up to the Nazgul just as the rapids came and washed the servants of Sauron away. With this last stand, Frodo lost consciousness. After two long days Frodo awoke. The fragments of the blade that had stabbed him had been removed by Lord Alrond of Rivendell, and Gandalf had now arrived too. Frodo would hear of what had happened and have many meetings within the Alvin Haven, even meeting the dwarf Glowin that had been on the quest of Erebor with Bilbo all those years ago and talking of Bilbo, 17 years after they had last seen each other, they once again meet in Rivendell, catching up on all goings on with the Hobbits and the Shire. 
Now all caught up, on October 25th, 3018, the Council of Alrond is summoned. Much is discussed, and by the end of it all, the main outcome is that Frodo will take the One Ring to Mordor, and with that, a fellowship are formed to help him on his way. Led by Gandalf, you also have Aragorn, Lagolas, Imli, Oromir, Sam, Merry, Hippin, and then of course, Frodo. And with this, to help him on his quest, Bilbo also passes down his sword, Sting, to Frodo, as well as the mithril coat that Thorin had gifted to him all those years before. However, they would not actually leave Rivendell for another two months, December 25th to be exact, as they needed to scout the surrounding areas thoroughly to make sure it was safe before they left. The Fellowship have now left Rivendell, and their first plan is to cross the Misty Mountains. However, their first attempt at this is by the Redhorn Pass, but the cold weather was too deadly and they had to turn back. In their decline, they are then attacked by wargs, which leads Gandalf to suggesting that their best path now is out of the eyes of those trying to watch them, and so it is to take the road under the mountain, through the once great dwarven realm of Khazad-dûm. They reach the West Gate, where the group are now attacked again, this time by one of the unknown creatures of Middle-earth. The Watcher in the water, and Frodo barely makes it out of this alive. But from this, they are now trapped inside of the mines, so no matter what, they cannot turn back now. They begin their journey through, with Frodo getting the feeling that something was following them, but they pass through to the Great 21st Hall and then reach the Chamber of Mazarbal, where they discover the fate of Gimli's cousin Balin, also one of those who had been on the quest of Erebor with Bilbo, and here, once again, they are attacked, this time by orcs. During this attack, the Fellowship actually believed Frodo to be killed, but his mithril coat saved him from an orc spear. There is no time to rest now though, for they have awoken Durin's Bane, one of the sleeping Balrogs of Morgoth who had hidden itself deep away. They all make their way to the Bridge of khazad where Gandalf stands against this great foe, breaking the bridge, and both then fall down into the great depths below, while Frodo can only watch on. Now under Aragorn's leadership, they escape from the mines and make their way into the wooded realm of Lothlorien. Here, within Karas Galadon, the city and fortress in Lothlorien, Frodo meets one of the other most powerful elves to still remain in Middle-earth, Galadriel. Together, Frodo and Sam look into the mirror of Galadriel, seeing much. But suddenly the mirror went altogether dark, as dark as if a hole had opened in the world of sight, and Frodo looked into emptiness. In the black abyss there appeared a single eye that slowly grew, until it filled nearly all the mirror. So terrible was it that Frodo stood rooted, unable to cry out or to withdraw his gaze. The eye was rimmed with fire, and was itself glazed, yellow as a cat's, watchful and intent, and the black slit of its pupil opened on a pit, a window into nothing. Then the eye began to rove, searching this way and that, and Frodo knew with certainty and horror that among the many things that it sought, he himself was one. But he also knew that it could not see him, not yet, not unless he willed it. The ring that hung upon its chain about his neck grew heavy, heavier than a great stone, and his head was dragged downwards. The mirror seemed to be growing hot, and curls of steam were rising from the water. He was slipping forward. Do not touch the water, said the Lady Galadriel softly. The vision faded, and Frodo found that he was looking at the cool stars twinkling in the silver basin. He stepped back, shaking all over, and looked at the Lady. A very testing moment for Frodo, but he came out the other side and the Fellowship would carry on their journey. Before leaving though, each member would receive a gift from Galadriel, with Frodo receiving the file of Galadriel, and this was a file that contained the court light from the Silmaril of Eärendil, a truly amazing gift, and one that would surely come in handy later. Now, out of Lothlorien, Frodo would travel with the Fellowship by boat along the River Anduin, making their way to their next camping spot at Amon Hen. It is in fact during this portion of the trip that Frodo becomes aware that it is indeed Gollum who has been giving him that feeling of being followed. While at Amon Hen, Boromir attempts to take the ring from Frodo after giving in to the darkness that stems from it, and realising what the ring had done, Frodo realises that he must continue alone if even the likes of the almighty Boromir would succumb to it. However, when Frodo gets back to the boats and attempts to cross over the Nenhithowal, he is found by Samwise. Sam will not let Frodo go, even if it is into the depths of Mordor itself. I know that well enough, Mr. Frodo. Of course you are. 
and I'm coming with you. Now it is just the two of them, Frodo Baggins and Samwise Gamgee, and the first part of their part of the quest is to get over the grey hills of the Emin Wheel and down into the Land of Shadow. It is then here, amongst the Emin Wheel, that Gollum is captured with the help of the Alvin Rope. Frodo comes to trust Gollum enough to use him as their guide, and he leads them into the Dead Marshes. This way may have no orcs, but multiple times they must hide from Nazgul who now ride on their fell beasts overhead. They make it through though and reach Karkost, the northern western end of Mordor, as this is where Frodo had planned to enter from. However, upon seeing this, Gollum persuades Frodo to take a different way, a supposedly safer way, the way of the Pass of Kirithungal further south. This meant the next plan, work their way down south through North Ithilien. However, while camping here they get discovered by Faramir, the brother of Boromir and his Ithilien rangers. Frodo and Sam were taken as captives on suspicion of being spies and questioned. In private, Sam accidentally let slip about the ring, but Faramir managed to resist it and in turn both parties gained the trust of each other. Frodo also stopped Faramir from killing Gollum, releasing him back into Frodo's control. The next day Faramir let the three go, but warned against Gollum's advice of taking the pass of Kirithungal. However, Frodo still trusted Gollum enough that that was the only passable way. Frodo and the other two then continued on their way, reaching the crossroads of the Fallen King, shown by a statue of a king that had now been defaced by Mordor. And this was where the north-south road of the Harrod Road crossed the east-west road that connected Osciliath to Minas Morgul, or once Minas Ethel. From here they made their way to Minas Morgul, witnessing the great host of the Witch King that marched from it. They snuck past and Gollum led them up the straight stair first, before also revealing they had an even longer winding stair to climb straight afterwards. This is where the next part of the nightmare begins, for Gollum had brought them into the trap of the home of the great spider Shelob. She stung Frodo, but Sam managed to save him before he could be eaten. However, Sam believed Frodo to be dead, so he took the ring himself, determined to finish what they started. Before he could make to leave though, orcs from the Tower of Kirithungal appeared and took Frodo's body, revealing that he was in fact still alive. Frodo was taken then to the Tower and kept there for torture, that is, before Samwise the Brave once again saves him, with the two then managing to escape and attempt to make their way across Mordor. They even get caught within a marching company of orcs and must pretend that they are orcs until they can make their getaway unseen. At last, they reach Mount Doom and into the cracks of Doom where Sauron had forged the ring all those years before. It was not as simple as to just throw it in though, for at the last moment, being that deep into Mordor, Frodo's will cracked and he claimed the One Ring for himself. He had gotten so close, but was this their last chance gone? Not quite, as Gollum reappears and attacks Frodo. He bites off Frodo's finger to gain the ring, taking it for himself, but in his joy, and I mean in his immense joy, he falls into the fire with the ring, finally destroying that magical, golden, but evil ring. This is not where the story ends though, for Frodo and Sam still needed to escape, and thanks to the great eagle Gwai here and his companions, they were rescued and taken to Ithilien. Here it took a good month, but they managed to heal Frodo of the wounds he suffered, and he would go to spend some time here afterwards. He would be present at the coronation of Aragorn into King Elisar of the Reunited Kingdoms, along with his wedding to Arwen, daughter of Alrond of Rivendell. And Arwen did something incredible for Frodo too, for she gave him her place to sail into the west to a man. An unthinkable gift, but not one he would take straight away. Frodo would also attend the funeral of King Theoden in Edoras before setting off back for the Shire. On the return journey, Frodo would see Saruman and Wormtongue, but be told to pay little attention to them for they no longer had any power, and then they would continue to go by Lothlorien, then to reach Rivendell, where once again Frodo would be reunited with Bilbo. He would spend a couple of weeks here before continuing again by way of the Prancing Pony in Bree and then finally back into the Shire. Gandalf who had travelled with them the entire way left at Buckland Gate to go and meet with Tom Bombadil, and then the four remaining hobbits would make their way for home at the end of October in 3019. However, upon returning things were not as they expected, for the Shire had been taken over by ruffians and their leader called Sharky, 
who they discover to truly be Saruman. He had polluted the Shire, wanting revenge on all of the halflings, but with the return of the hobbits, Saruman was overthrown. After everything he had been through, Frodo wished for there to be no more killing though, so he refused to have Saruman murdered. Not that that mattered too much though, for a tortured and suppressed worm tongue finally snapped and stabbed his master before being shot down by hobbit archers himself. Finally, there could be some peace brought back to the Shire, and Frodo and the others helped restore things to the way that they once were. However, despite the peace returning, every March 13th and October 6th, Frodo would fall ill. March 13th being the day that he was wounded by Shelob, and October 6th being the day that he had been stabbed by the Witch King. During the peace, Frodo would spend a short time serving as the Mayor of Mikkel Dalvin, also known as the Mayor of the Shire, but only until the true Mayor, Will Whitfoot, had recovered from being imprisoned during the scouring of the Shire. Frodo would go on to have no family of his own, and along with the pains that he still continued to suffer, in September of 3021, Frodo finally decided to take Arwen's place. And so, on September 21st, 3021, Frodo left everything to Samwise Gamgee and then set out for the Grey Havens with Sam. On his way they joined Alrond, Galadriel and Bilbo, and then Gandalf later too. Together they all boarded the white ship to sail into the west. Here Frodo would spend his remaining days, now free of any of the wounds that he had once suffered, finally released from everything that had come before. So there we have it, a look at the full story of Frodo Baggins. He is one of the most famous hobbits to have ever existed in Middle Earth, and debatably one of the most famous fictional characters to have ever existed in our world. Frodo was an incredibly brave character who took on an impossible task of destroying the One Ring. The most powerful beings in Middle Earth would not even dare to touch Sauron's weapon, yet this small, unassuming being took it all the way from the Shire and simply walked into Mordor to destroy it. Yes, you can say that he failed in the end, but it is hard to argue any other being we know of could have gotten anywhere near to the end like he did. It says a lot when you are given the gift that means you can travel into the west at the end of it all. Frodo Baggins is well and truly a wonderful hobbit. And now, just to finish off, I feel it is worth looking at a quote from one of J.R.R. Tolkien's letters that tells us about Frodo and what he undertook from the writer himself. Frodo undertook his quest out of love, to save the world he knew from disaster at his own expense if he could, and also in complete humility, acknowledging that he is wholly inadequate to the task. His real contract was only to do what he could, to try to find a way, and to go as far on the road as his strength of mind and body allowed. He did that. I do not myself see that the breaking of his mind and will under demonic pressure after torment was any more a moral failure than the breaking of his body would have been, say, by being strangled by Gollum or crushed by a falling rock. That appears to have been the judgement of Gandalf and Aragorn, and of all who learnt the full story of his journey. Certainly nothing would be concealed by Frodo, but what Frodo himself felt about the events is quite another matter. So I hope you all enjoyed this video for today, and this now leads me on to my question for you all today, and that is, do you feel the movies did a disservice to Frodo? Many fans of just the film seem to dislike him, do you think this is wrong, or do you truly get Tolkien's version of the character from it? But if not, what do you think was changed for better or worse? Really, what do you think about the character of Frodo in both versions? Please let me know all of your thoughts and opinions on this in the comment section below. And now firstly to finish off, quickly to mention our other channels that will be linked in the description below if you'd like to check them out, and also to shout out our patrons. Firstly our Divine Power tier members of Kevin, Abraham and Matt, you are all awesome, and a big thanks to our Fire Demon tier members of Nasheeth, Denversteel and Gregory, and as well I cannot forget the Wizard Staff tier members of John, Andrew, Bill and Evil Chameleon. You are all true legends of the Brohirim. Finally, if you have managed to reach the very end of this video with me today, all I ask is, if you enjoyed it, please drop a like on the video, hit that subscribe button, hit the bell icon too, and why not share the video as well if you really, really did enjoy it. So thank you once again if you have managed to reach the very end of this video with me today, and I will see you next time on The Broken Sword.